into what we really have for today. I want to use this opportunity to tell you guys that there is this group that is called, that call themselves obedience in Imo State. And they've come out to say they are giving their support to Governor Hope Uzodema for him to come back the second time as the governor of Imo State. We all know that obedience movement is a movement that does not have any conflict when it comes to leadership. But this person has come out to say he is a, one of the leaders in obedient movement and that the obedience in Imo State are giving their support to Governor Hope Uzodema. No time has the obedient uh, movement that is for Peter Obi took such a decision to support Governor Hope Uzodema. Don't forget that the Labour Party has its own uh, candidate in Imo State. So the obedience are in no way supporting Governor Hope Uzodema because we know that the Labour Party has a credible governorship candidate in Imo State. And that is the person we are going to be supporting. That is the person Mr. Peter Obi is supporting. So for this group that has come out and the governor is using them to tell the world that they are obedient movement and that they are supporting Governor Hope Uzodema, please distance yourself from those people. They are never members of the obedient movement. And you can imagine the level of desperation in our leaders, you can imagine the kind of desperation. They know that obedience movements are a, it's a group of people. These are people that have come out to support Mr. Peter Obi. Like one of the Labour Party spokesperson once said that this is Peter Obi's brand. As in, these are people that are supporting Mr. Peter Obi. You can imagine uh, Governor Hope Zodema. I don't know to what extent that he influenced these guys and they came out, they are now saying that they are obedient movement and that the obedient movement in, movement in Imo State are now, you know, throwing their weight behind him. Please, these are not obedient. So I'm going to be playing that video before we move over to other things that we have for today. Carrying several banners are received by the governor as they pledge their total support for him ahead of the November 11 polls. Afterwards, the governor attends the inauguration of over 10,000 members of the Imo Progressives Movement at the Indubisi Kanu Square in Owari, a support group spread across the 27 local government areas of Imo State with the aim of soliciting support for the governor ahead of the election. The group maintains that the governor remains the best choice for Imo State. In his address, Governor Uzodima promises to grant amnesty and rehabilitate all youths involved in insecurity in the state. And for the November elections, he gives assurances of adequate security to the people. Our youth must earn a living. Tell those brothers and sisters of, uh, of ours who are being deceived, who are in the bush killing and shooting gun, tell them to come out. I have a job for them. I will rehabilitate them. Those who are against us on November 11th, watch the pulling unit. Don't be afraid of anybody. <coughs> Cast their votes. Wait there. When you wait there, they will count their votes. They will enter the votes. They will transmit the results. Until that is done, don't leave the pulling unit. Well, He's extending this hand of invitation. I wish he had done this before now. If he had done this before now, the level of, you know, killings we experienced in Imo State wouldn't have happened. You know, sometimes these are leaders. They don't really have this negotiating skill. This is a very important skill when it comes to leadership. And we all know that that was what Mr. The, uh, the former president, Buhari, didn't equally have he never like try to position himself to like listen to those who are agitating 
Rather, he went off on them and up to today, they've not still found solution to some of those problems that we were experiencing. The same thing is happening in Imo State. I tell you, Imo State has suffered so much since this governor came in as the governor of the state. And now he's calling him, he's inviting them that he has got a job for them because he's looking for another opportunity to come back to government house. These are the kind of leaders that we, we have. But I just hope that the Imo State people will be very, very intelligent, you know, in choosing the right person that they know will take them to the promised land. So guys, apart from this update, Mr. Moralo has come out and he has come out very tough talking about the way this government is managing the affairs of the country. You can see that Nigeria Senate approves Tinubu's $800 million World Bank loan request. Yes, they told us when they came in that they were not going to borrow. We all know that Buhari borrowed a lot and you look at how Naira has fallen. So servicing that debt has been very, very challenging. If you've been using like $1 million to, challenge, to service this debt, now you'll be using like $2 million because Naira keeps falling every day. So now they are moving to go and borrow more loans. And I tell you, Nigerians are really shouting. People are lamenting. Some people say this is just pure wickedness because... They feel not to even look at the cry of the masses. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to know. And even the consequence of this borrowing, most times we don't even know where and where this money go to. And that is why Nigerians are like lamenting at the moment. Somebody tweeted a tweet today on Twitter. Let me read it. I thought I had the image. That's what I was looking for. He said, $800 million is equal to $80 billion Naira loan. You can imagine, this is the, the equivalent in Naira, 80 billion Naira loan. And one keep asking, how are they going to manage this money? What is, it, what is going to be the return on investment? Where are they even going to channel it? How are they going to monitor it? These were some of the mistakes that Buhari made when he came in as president. He told us he came to fight corruption. He was borrowing and just throwing it into the, 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 the economy without proper you know, channeling, without even monitoring. They will just bring in money and then before you know it, that money is down. They will now go for another borrowing. And you know, IMF and other bodies like this uh, World Bank, it is business that they do. They are ready to give you anything you want, provided you'll be able to pay back and then the interest will be added. They are just there, you know, to do what they are meant to do. So you can't come to them and tell them you need money and they will tell you no. So Mr. Moalo has come out to condemn it. He has really condemned it vehemently. And don't forget that uh, the National, the House of Assembly members, they are going for their SUVs. We talked about this yesterday, and each of it is going to be costing 100, 160 million naira. I mean, one of those. So I'm going to allow you to listen to what Mr. Moralo got to say. And I tell you, these people are very intelligent people that our government is still not wanting to make use of their intelligence, possibly because they are not members of their parties. You can imagine when this man, when I listen to him, I say, God, we have people like this and Nigeria is crumbling. In case you don't know, Nigeria has gone bankrupt. Nothing is working and we don't really see them managing the situation on ground, you know, very effectively. You know that there's that leadership gap. There's that leadership gap. Even the president himself, we don't really think he's that health-wise, very strong to attend to the needs of Nigerians currently. So it's like he's just there on a ceremonial basis and while others are the ones running the government and we don't see much happening in the system. So let me just allow you to listen to what Mr. Moa look got to say. Uh, no beating around the bush. Uh, give us your, us in, in summary, do you think that the Nigerian economy is in distress at the moment? The unambiguous answer is yes, of course. Yeah, the economy is very deeply distressed. Nigeria is practically bankrupt. There's no question uh, in my mind about that. 
um, poverty has increased, you know, to very, very unconscionable degrees. Unemployment is about 40 percent. Um, you know, the Naira is in distress. So, yes, the economy is in very, very bad shape. No question about it. I mean, so development experts will say that there is nothing wrong with borrowing. But with the kind of burden that Nigeria has, recently, a few months ago, just a few weeks after the president was sworn into office, um, the uh, debt management office had warned that we can no longer afford to borrow recklessly and go into more borrowings. We need to be careful warning for the government and state governments about borrowing and uh, about the delicate state of the economy. Now, this is what you said on your uh, X, on your Twitter account today. And you said there is a real problem when Nigeria is set to borrow another 1.5 billion US dollar from World Bank for budget support and SUVs worth 160 million Naira each are reported to be bought for 360 members of the House of Representatives. We are not yet serious as a country. Is that an indictment on the government of the day about the seriousness to rejuvenate and wake up the sleeping economy of, of Africa's giant? Yes, it is. Um, it is an indictment on the political class more specifically. Um, not just the government, because, you know, in the government, you have the executive, uh, then you have the legislature. Now, these uh, uh, jeeps that are going to be bought by uh, or for the members of the House of Representatives are going to cost, you know, hundreds of millions of, 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 of billions of Naira. Now, when somebody and you're borrowing 1.5 billion from the World Bank, the person who is lending you the 1.5 billion at the World Bank knows that at the same time as they're lending you this morning, your politicians in the National Assembly are taking care of themselves with exorbitantly priced you know, products. Now, what do you think that person at the World Bank will do? You think he's going to say, oh, you know, I love your country. Um, we will not give you this loan, you know, because it might be a mistake. No. They're in business to lend to you. You know, that's their own institutional mandate. It is for developing countries like Nigeria to look at themselves very seriously. Why do you think that a country in the situation Nigeria is in today, where it ordinarily should not be borrowing anymore, because 96% of our revenues went to servicing external debt in 2022. And we have a, a, a debt stock of $110 billion. Nigeria is debt distressed already. So if you have this and you feel the need to still borrow and your political leaders are engaging in this type of behavior, why would anybody take such a country seriously? There's not even a consideration to say, Okay, if they must have jeeps, we are going to buy locally produced goods, jeeps that would cost maybe 50 billion each instead of 160, uh, uh, sorry, 50 million each instead of 160 million each or 130. That would even show some indication, some sensitivity to the suffering of the Nigerian masses. But no, you don't have that. So, so my comment is simply a reflection of the fact that the political class in Nigeria more broadly have prevented the economic progress of Nigeria because of their own self-seeking and rent-seeking behavior. This is the problem. It's the problem is not so much about borrowing, but first of all, when you want to borrow, what are you borrowing for? Ideally, you should borrow for projects that earn a return you know, on investment and help you to repay the borrowing. But that's not the kind of borrowing we do in Nigeria. Certainly since 2015, we've had all these loans, borrowing, 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 and more borrowing, and we are being told all kinds of things to justify the borrowing. The bottom line is that it just creates distress for the Nigerian economy, especially coupled with the foreign exchange crisis. You have to pay back this money in, uh, in dollars. Now, even if it's zero interest, you know? so. I, I, I'm not saying that under no condition should we borrow, but the timing is such and the situation in Nigeria that we should look inwards about the cost of governance in our country. We're not doing anything about it. 
and we go to very easy solutions like getting into more debt. Leadership is, you know, is, is, is about consequences and it's about legacy. And our political leaders in Nigeria must consider the judgment of history on them, especially at this time that we're going through. People are so poor, citizens are suffering so incredibly, and people are just living large in Abuja as if, you know, it don't, not, nothing matters. Um, and, I, and I find this quite, um, you know, so when you're saying you're running an economy, you run an economy not based on technicalities. You run an economy based on the context of the society. So we need to go back to the drawing table. I would, I would recommend that our political class seriously consider their legacy, the judgment of history on them, especially given what we're going through in Nigeria, and see what sacrifices that they themselves can make to help the federal government, you know, shoulder the burden of responsibility. Look, the current government in place was not the government that created the mess we're in. That's just the fact of the matter. They have inherited it. They've taken some decisions, removing of the subsidies, uh, petroleum, forex, and those decisions had to be taken. No question, we cannot continue to subsidize those things. The problem was that they did not show adequate forward thinking and planning for the consequences of those policy choices. And that is why I always talk about, you know, the policy competence more broadly. It's not just about thinking things, you know, or, or saying, oh, we will issue palliatives. What is a palliative? A palliative is not a solution to anything. It's simply a dressing on a wound that does not go to the real root cause. So the way we think about managing the economy must be more serious it must be more, um, shall we say, we should look for more internal solutions. And the general cost of governance must come down because it is contributing to our fiscal distress. So, Prof, that's if, the point. Yeah, if you're looking at cost of governance, can we, uh, yes. I'd like us to be uh, practically speaking, I'd like us to be practical and speak truth to power tonight. Um, and uh, Meg, it, wa it was a sad commentary when an economist on the program had said that the Buhari government had battered this economy and that it set this country 20, 20 years back in terms of economic development. Uh, and it's, sad, it's a sad narrative that we are at, at, at that stage, that we had eight years, and after eight years, economists, will, experts will say there is a government that run this economy and run it at ground to the point that it said we were being set back for 20 years. Now, if you are to... Speak practically, Prof, based on the manner in which governance and government is being run in this country, what are those specific things that will help us to cut down the cost of governance? So that tonight, when citizens see government, because I see a lot of sirens around town these days, uh, one person with several vehicles running around the city in a city that looks very safe and i'm wondering what exactly is going on at every interval you see sirens all over the city and i'm wondering how many people do need these sirens but if you are to pick out specific things that we need to cut that on in terms of cost of governance what would that be well um first of all we need to address the culture of governance the culture of governance we have in nigeria is very weak People do not feel uh, a sense of responsibility and accountability to deliver services to the Nigerian people. And there is no real measurement of it that we can see. There is no accountability process that we can see. These things are all part of the governance architecture. So the culture of governance is a very important issue that needs to be addressed. And the tone has to be set from the top, from the presidency down. You know, um, and it has to include the National Assembly because a lot of resources go to the National Assembly and they are supposed to be independent of the executive. So they themselves must come on board, examine themselves and say, look, you know, even if we've been making these mistakes in the past, we cannot continue this way. We have to cut our salaries. I recommend a 50% cut for all political office holders and all national legislators. It will make people a little bit more sober. It will make them understand that we're in hard times. So the culture of governance, 
all these excessive demonstrations of power and influence, it's a very negative culture because it shows that government is not for service. It is for self-aggrandizement. It is for political power for its own sake, not for leadership and service. And this has to cut across the board, both across the legislature and across the executive. Cut down the salaries and the allowances. You know, cut, cut down the perks of office. You know, in European countries, in Scandinavia, you'll see a prime minister is riding his bicycle to work. Ministers are riding their bicycles. Why does everybody in Nigeria want a siren and a long convoy? There's something wrong with the way we think. And this is why the black man is poor. So all that show of power, all that show of pomp and pageantry, and you're meandering through potholes with your 20-car convoy and your SUVs, you don't pause to think, right? but you visit countries that are actually developed or are developing. So there's, a, there's something internally wrong with our value system, and that is where we must so, begin. So, so I, I, yes. I, yeah, Prof, I'll take you again to uh, uh, another practical, uh, for the sake yeah. of our viewers tonight. Um, Absolutely. So you look at it, and, and where I come from, there is a popular prophet saying, uh, literally, that how your day will look like will exactly show in the early hours of the day. I mean, how in the morning, you plan, yes. in, the morning in the early hours, you, you already know yes, how your absolutely. day will pan out. And so one can imagine how a Tinubu government could be from the early day policy and decisions they have made. For you, would being around the corridor of power, being at the, I mean, the deputy governor of the CBN, for some of his policies, I mean, at a point in time, a governor in, and one of the state governors has said that the government of Buari was printing money. Ways and means are being badly, decisions were being badly done, and National Assembly follows suit in those policies. And you will imagine that maybe there will be a conscience of someone who will speak up in that sense. But if we are to assess what is going on right now, the early day decision and policies of the Tenobu government, economically speaking, do you think our day from the early hours on the morning is going to speak well? I, I think it's a bit early to make that assessment, I must say. Um, however, they, like I said, they took some courageous decisions, but they did not show deep thinking. And this is a problem we have always had in managing Nigeria's economy. People come and just talk a good game. Oh, we're looking for foreign investors, oh, this, oh, that. At the end of the day, what translates to the ground for the common man, the average man, is joblessness and poverty. You know, the, 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 the solution to Nigeria's economic problems does not lie in technical economics. It lies in the broader culture of governance. It lies in creating an inclusive nationhood where we all have a common sense of purpose. If this is not done, you can talk until the cows come home. You can have the best of intentions, but many people do not feel included. And the economic policy making may not have the depth. It takes a lot of work to turn an economy such as Nigeria's around. And we need to see that work being done. You know, we need to see a certain level of depth, a certain level of substance. We have to address issues of the political economy. We have to address issues of nationhood. We have to address issues of our political culture, of waste and corruption. When you want to fight corruption, you have to put in place measures that create transparency and prevent corruption. Let everybody see the money trail. How are the budgets made? Where are the line items? Where are they going? And how are they executed? What is the project management? What is the return on investment? These are the things. That's how you fight corruption. It's not just about arresting people you don't like or people who have, uh, quote unquote, winched you in the past. That's not fighting corruption, you know? So we, we, we just need to think very differently about Nigeria. Uh, in order for our economy to be able to come up to what it should be, yeah. So we, a, a, we again, also need to have some, yeah. We also need to have some very important understandings. You see, the economy needs short-term, immediate measures. Then it needs medium-term measures. Then it needs long-term measures. We are 
currently fiscally very distressed. I understand that. So where do they find money from? It means it includes cutting down the cost of governance. It includes things like maybe considering asset sales. You need to bring 10 to 15 to 20 billion dollars into this economy quickly. And but you must make sure that as you're doing that, you are planning for beyond the one year in which you will do this. How is the economy being structurally turned around so that we will be exporting more and more value added goods so that we are no longer an import dependent economy? You must make those plans and you must begin to execute them. You don't wait, you don't sell your assets or borrow money and finish quote unquote chopping it over the next two or three years and you're still where you were when you borrowed. Prof, this uh, is the problem we've had in this country. Yeah. I mean, the average and the poor person here in Nigeria, we, we, we can relate to my uh, uh, description of the indices of the economy, uh, swelling as if uh, uh, a gari that you, you put a lot of water in, and uh, those indices, inflation is right, food inflation rising, and they, these are negative uh, descriptions. The security, of, the security situation is a big problem now, and it affects the food supply, the electricity situation is also very fundamental. If you don't fix the electricity problem of Nigeria, Nigeria's economy has no hope because it cannot be productive. And inflation will remain high because 40 to 50% of business costs of business owners is in electricity uh, uh, generator bills or, or expenses, and they will put it into their prices. So prices will remain constantly elevated and such that even when you tighten the money supply, the central bank tightens the money supply, but it's not enough to fight inflation because Nigeria's inflation is not the standard kind of inflation. There's a lot of structural problems like lack of electricity and the forex problem. How do we increase the supply of forex? There are serious problems of confidence in the Nigerian economy, and that comes from governance, you know, uh, miscues that we see every day. Even now, we still see them, even though the economy was something that this government inherited. But we are yet to see, in my own view, we, I am yet to see, you know, the level of understanding and seriousness that will actually turn the situation around. But let's wait All right. another six months. It will be one year and prof, we see where we are. Yeah, Prof, on a final note, and this is all I'd like you yes. to wrap up. I'd like to ask you to turn around things. Um, experts will speak to the economy and it will listen to them if they do the right thing. Uh, if you were in President Tunubu's shoes, what would you do immediately to stem the rising uh, indices uh, in the negative of the economy and to ensure that the economy is... Uh, uh, jolted such that it can be benefit, beneficiary, uh, beneficial to Nigerians? First of all, if I were the president, I need to strike directly at the political culture to restore confidence in the government. Today, the citizens of Nigeria have no confidence in the government. And that's because they see the politicians living large while they themselves are suffering. So, like I told you, the solutions to Nigeria's economic problems are not truly just you know technical economic issues there's a governance lack of confidence you know so i would say i'm cutting my salary 50 percent all members of all political appointees the national assembly should follow suit and if i were president i would say and get the national assembly to agree that any vehicle to be bought for any government official should be a Nigerian produced vehicle. That's how you show patriotism. That's how you show you're responding to the situation you find yourself in. You cannot continue to live above your means. Even as an individual, I have to tailor my expenses uh, to my ability. You know, I live a fairly modest life. I don't go around with 20 uh, temp car convoys. There are people who are private citizens who do that because they think they can afford it. But it's more of a value system issue. You know, so that's a very important point. I would, if I were president, I would focus a lot on the matter of confidence. Mm -hmm. What is it that right. is making people not have confidence in the Nigerian economy mm -hmm. and take immediate steps to fix yeah. it? Hmm. Yes, he has to focus on building confidence. Why are Nigerians losing confidence in our government? Why are even foreign investors not having confidence in 
the Nigerian economy. We all know the controversies, you know, surrounding the 2023 presidential election, the controversies surrounding the tribunal judgment. And, you know, so many people have been talking about the Supreme Court. Don't forget that we are left with just about 20 days for the time that the Supreme Court is supposed to hand over judgment to Nigerians. We just have 20 days to go. They've not given us dates for the final ruling. And from the look of things, I just pray they don't do what they did during the tribunal. If you can remember, all of a sudden they gave us dates. And then they gave us a kind of ruling that up to today, Nigerians are still shocked at the kind of judgment that we got from the tribunal. This time, the Supreme Court is not like giving us dates. They're supposed to give Nigerians dates and say, look at when we are going to give the final ruling. But till today, we've not gotten that. And they don't even know that these things turn around to hurt the economy. It turns around to hurt the, the economy. People are looking at Nigeria. They can't really see why they should come in to invest because you don't know what to happen tomorrow. People are not very sure, so much uncertainty. The, 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 the judiciary is not helping out matters because if they had fixed a date, assuming somebody is planning to come to invest in Nigeria, it's okay. Thank God the, the verdict to be given on so, so, and so date. So after this time, I should be looking forward to making up my mind whether to invest in Nigeria or not. But as it stands now, we don't even know when the final ruling will be given. And they are left with just 20 days. So you can imagine. And Mr. Peter Abi was saying it in one of his speeches. He said, it's not all about going out to look for investors that fix your home country. When you fix your home country, investors will see need for them to come to invest in your country. You don't need to be running after them. Just do the necessary things. And, you know, Mr. Moore, I talked about confidence. That's number one. Building confidence. How can Nigerians have confidence? It all has to do with, you know, all the government bodies, all the government institutions like our judiciary, ensuring that Nigerians can trust and believe in our judiciary. When you have a case in court, you believe that whatever the court gives is the right judgment. We want such a thing to happen. And you see people who believe in us. So you don't just come and you, you take taxpayers' money, you begin to move from one country to the other that, that you are going to look for investors without fixing the country that you are ruling. Look at insecurity everywhere. There is a video currently on Twitter of a guy who was going for his youth service and he was kidnapped around Abuja area. He said there are many in that den, I mean in the camp of the enemy. There are many there. Some people, their parents were able to provide money and they've been released, but still there are many of them being held. And he was like asking for help on Twitter. So you can imagine when people from other countries see this kind of thing, you begin to wonder where would they get the, the how would they summon the courage to come and invest in Nigeria? I will not say this government taking drastic measures in arresting, you know, all these uh, 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 security challenges. There are a lot of them going on, even those of them that have not been uh, spoken about by the media. There are so many things happening. And look at the government officials, I mean, the, 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 the politicians, they don't even care about what is happening in the country. They just want to have new cars. I think Showare came up, he was like condemning uh, members of the National Assembly from Labour Party, from PDP, and also from YPP. He mentioned these three parties, that none of them could stand bold and reject this offer. And so, okay, we don't want this vehicles because the money is huge considering the economical state of nigeria today you can't afford to be taken this is like feeding on people's blood nigerians are sweating to pay this tax today so many businesses are crumbling there's no electricity upon the the forex challenges that businesses are going through today for you to import one thing, you go and carry money in Ghana must go bad because the value of Naira is going down. It's depreciating everything. So there are a lot of challenges out there. 
And we don't even know what is happening. We don't even know if they have clue on how to arrest this situation. Look at this moral. With somebody like this, Nigerian politicians will not even want to go to source for people like this. They will first of all tag him that maybe he's from the southeast or he's an Igbo or you know all those things that exist in, in Nigeria, especially among our political class. They will use tribalism and all that to like ignore people like this who even have some clue as in they have some ideas to what and what to do so that nigeria will come out from the mess we are today but they will not go for him because he's not a member of the apc neither did he support the, the current president and all that don't forget a member of the senate that was <laughs> sacked by the supreme court he has come out to say that why he was sacked is because he did not support the Senate president. So you can imagine, if you don't support the Senate president, according to him, then the judges, the judges will sack you because you did not support a politician. So you can see how low Nigeria has descended. These are some of the things that we, we really have to fix. We must fix all this. And this will start from our judiciary. We want them to give a judgment that the whole world is going to celebrate. I mean, as regards to this election, uh, 2023 presidential election, let them give a judgment that Nigerians will, you know, stand up and clap for them. Let them give their reasons for their judgment so that when people read it, you will see need. You will understand why they went the direction they went. Mr. Peter will be article. They've all said they are going to take whatever the Supreme Court gives us its verdict. But when they rule, let them rule in a way that Nigerians will know where they are coming from. Not coming to read out judgment like the one we saw last time. And people, some people kept saying that these people never even made reference of the constitution. Neither did they make reference to the electoral act. So you can imagine. But they ended up making a ruling. And when people talk, they say you shouldn't talk. So that is where we are as a country. We have people in power who do not care. The empathy is not there. And they are just desperate to be in that position. We are just hoping that Nigeria will not collapse. If you listen to Moral when he began, he said Nigeria is currently bankrupt. As in Nigeria is currently bankrupt. We use 96% of our revenue in servicing debt. 96. So you can imagine if you get your salary, you use 96% to go and pay somebody you borrowed money from. You ask yourself, what will be left with you? You are almost like, you know, having your pockets empty. So that is the condition Nigeria is today. And our National Assembly members are going to look for cars that cost 160 million naira per each. So you can imagine by the time they buy it across themselves, how much would have been spent. Mr. Moralu is advising them to use that money. Go and invest in a local uh, produced vehicles. No doubt you can split that money like in three places and just use only one part in buying it locally. Instead of going to invest that money in other economies, they are going to Japan to buy these vehicles because most times it's Toyota they use. They will go to Japan, calculate all this money, go and heap it in the Jap Japan economy while our own economy will keep crumbling. So you find a situation whereby the president is going to borrow money and the little you have in your savings, then they, the politicians want to use it to go and buy SUV. So you balance it, you just find out that these people are just filling a pocket that is already having a hole. So each time they put something, it falls off, you know, it cannot be retained and Nigeria will just keep going down if these situations are not arrested. So guys, this is what I felt I should share with you guys because we also have to put our eyes on what is happening in the economy. We know we have this challenge of, you know, the, the certificate forgery of a thing and we are looking forward to the Supreme Court doing the right thing, you know, going deep into this and to ensure that they give befitting judgment that Nigerians will embrace, everybody will wake up. But at the same time, we also have to pay our attention to what is happening in our economy. So as it stands, the Nigerian economy is really crumbling and we must like add our voices in telling them to 
wake up from their sleep and their slumber and to arrest the current situation so that some people will find food on their tables to eat and also to take care of their children. So guys, this is all I have for you tonight. Dr. Etel was not able to make it today, so he'll be back tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow again. Please do well to like this video, support us, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell for future updates. And with this, I want to say a very big thank you for joining me tonight. See you again tomorrow. Good night.